You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Whites. Welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Today we are hosting a two-part discussion that reaches both backward and forward into the world of film photography. In the first part of our show, we're going to be speaking with Levi Betweiser of the Rescued Film Project based in Boise, Idaho. Betweiser and his small team collect, process, and archive orphaned film, basically any film of any format that has not been developed. Film arrives from all over the country, and they take it in. We will first ask why, and then we'll get into the specifics of how they obtain the undeveloped film, process it, and store it. In the second half of today's episode, we're going to embrace the other side of the film equation with Dick Haviland, proprietor of Film for Classics, a small operation located near Rochester, New York, whose motto is, obsolescence is just a lack of imagination. They provide film for camera formats long forgotten by many, but still needed by a few. Those that shoot 127, 620, 116, and other film formats. We'll be speaking with Dick about how he got into the business, how he obtains film stock, prepares it, and how he markets it. The world of film photography is alive and well, and we'll talk with two folks proving just that. But first, a reminder to reach out to us about your favorite new camera of 2016. We're going to be recording our Cameras of the Year episode, and we want to know your picks. Will it be the new Fuji mirrorless medium format, the new Hasselblad, or maybe something from Nikon, Leica, or Canon? Drop us an email at podcast at bhphoto.com. Or you can tweet us at bhphotovideo with hashtag bhphotopodcast. With Levi Betweiser, the founder of the Rescued Film Project in Boise, Idaho. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I, I was watching the video uh, the other day about your project. It, it's amazing. C could you fill us in? H how did all of this start? Give us the whole background. Yeah. Well, I started the Rescued Film Project about three years ago, just kind of as a as a curiosity hobby, I guess you you could call it. I'm a film photographer, and I process my own film. And I started noticing that the cameras in thrift stores here in Boise would have rolls of film in them. So I just started buying them kind of out of curiosity to see if maybe some of those rolls of film still had pictures on them. And it took me about six months, but I was able to get about 30 to 40 rolls of color 35 millimeter film, enough to justify a batch of chemicals, and I spent a day processing. And I was actually pretty surprised at how many of the rolls still had images on them. And so I realized that you know, if I could get that many rolls of film just around Boise with images, there had to have been thousands around the world. And so I kind of expanded my search and started looking all over, and, and the Rescued Film Project kind of took off from there. Were there that's, any images? That's pretty ambitious to say from around the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> were, were there any images on that first set of, uh, of rolls that really struck you as something special, or they were just pretty mundane snapshots? What, what kind of drew you in other than the simple fact of uh, history and curiosity? Well, most of them actually were pretty just normal mundane because all of them were more modern film from modern cameras, 35 millimeter, like compact cameras. Mm -hmm. But there was this one roll that I got out of an underwater camera. I had to like bust the thing open, you know, one of those disposables. Uh -huh. And it was just completely full of images of these of these young boys playing with this camera underwater and bubbles. And they would just look like they're having so much fun. And those still to this day are some of my favorite images. Oh, interesting. And how many of the cameras that you found actually had rolls in them? Can you give like a percentage on it? Oh, well, I get most of my rolls just by themselves, not within cameras. But I have right. hundreds of cameras that I've bought specifically for the purpose that have rolls of film in them. So I don't buy a camera anymore unless it has film in it, in fact. <laughs> Dude, well, were you ever in situations where you really don't care about the camera, you just want the film in it? Work out a deal oh, with yeah. it? Okay, all right. Yeah, I, I buy cameras all the time only for the reason that they have film. And, you know, sometimes I try not to spend too much money on it. Hopefully they're usually around 5 or $6. But, I've you know, I've spent $50 on a camera took the roll of film out and tossed the camera in a box. <laughs> <laughs> and now are you looking mostly toward uh, – Older cameras or more interesting cameras when you're doing this, or is it still uh, whatever comes around? It doesn't matter the age, type of camera, type of film. If if it's been shot, I, I look for it. Okay. So now we're, we're three years in, and from what I'm seeing, you're getting people sending you stuff. So the, the operation is, has grown significantly. Is that true? Yeah. As soon as I made the project public, which you know it took me about six months to make that decision to actually put it out there and make it a project, 
I started accepting donations of film from people. And honestly, as soon as I made the project public, I started getting rolls of film. People would send me, you know, one or two that they found in cameras. But I've had film donations upwards of 150 rolls in one donation. Mm -hmm. And I get film arriving daily. Do, do people expect prints back in return, like you're the old photo mat or something? Or are they, are they just sending you film saying, here, it's yours, do as you wish? Yeah, well, the way the Rescue Film Project works is I'm not a film processing service. I don't. People don't pay me to process their film and, and send them prints. Oh, that's pretty clear. But are there people that say, you know, I have this film. Why don't I just send it to him, let him do it, and he'll make me send a print as a thank you? That's what I was wondering. Where are people just sending yeah, you the film? People just send me the film with the expectation that I will send them digital copies of any ah, images that I rescue off okay. of them. That's how it works. Yeah. Gotcha. And do you keep up with that? Or is it just uh, each situation is different? Oh, no. Every every roll donation, I, I label it as who donated it. And then as soon as I process it, I can backtrack, go to my files and email them the images that I get every every single roll. Or I will let them know if the roll turned out blank. I see. And, and then is this be turning into a commercial enterprise for you or, or what's uh, I mean, what's, what's the goal or is there a goal at this point? Well, I have a full-time job outside of rescued film. I'm mm -hmm. actually a video producer. Um, and so rescued film still is, and I hope it continues to just be a passion project. Mm -hmm. It has definitely taken on a life of its own and I could spend, you know, 40 hours a week doing just this That's if true. there was any kind of income to it, cause mm -hmm. there's not. Um, but I don't honestly ever really want it to be something that I rely on for income because then I think it, it kind of loses its its interest for me. I don't mm -hmm. ever really want it to feel like work. I want it to feel like a, a passion project and hobby always. So it's it's I have thousands of rolls of film and I could I could sit here and process film all day for a couple years probably and scan them in and I I wouldn't be done. And so. what's the um... What jazzes you? I'm trying to use one of Alan's yeah. phrases here, but, but is it is it finding that one image or that series of images that kind of depicts a moment in history or, or a lost family moment uh, or or maybe a great great greatly composed image? Yeah, people ask me sometimes if I'm looking for any like one particular image or you know the Kennedy assassination photos or something <laughs> like that. Um, but I'm really not in this to find any particular types of images. I am. You know what? I'm rejuvenated and re-energized every time I pull a roll out of my film tank and there are any images on it. Uh -huh. uh, it's a little disheartening when I get a blank roll, which happens constantly. But as soon as I get one roll, even with one image on it, it, it kind of rejuvenates me and I'm excited. And it doesn't really matter the context of the image because I, I feel like they're all important because they were that moment was important enough for someone to take a photo of. And so to me, I feel like it's an important image. What's the most aha photograph you've ever found or come across? Anything just totally blow you away? You know, I've got so many different types of images. I've got images of President Eisenhower. I've got images of the Apollo 13 landing that was shot on someone's TV. Mm -hmm. I've got <laughs> images of birthday parties and fishing trips and vacations. I've got so many different types of images. There is no – I'm not as surprised anymore by anything that I get – or at least I don't think I'll be surprised. I'm sure there'll be every batch there'll be another image. I'm like, wow, look at that. That's amazing. But I don't go into it expecting that, you know? I, I assume I assume that everything is gonna be pretty mundane and then that way when something a little bit more incredible pops up, I guess I'm a little bit more surprised. And how do you archive? Have you developed your own system uh, in order to retrieve images and based on the type of shot or, or the location or the dates? How does that work for you? Well, I've got so many images and I don't have a ton of time. So right now when I archive images and um, negatives, I pretty much just organize them by where they were sourced. Mm -hmm. So that would either be like the state or the country or the name of the person who donated the role. And it's just all organized that way. Okay. Are, are, is, are you getting calls from anybody about look? they're looking for certain pictures of certain eras that – snapshot kind of pictures for any kind of commercial or corporate application. I haven't gotten anything like that yet. I do get people who message me and they're like, hey, I lost a roll of film from my vacation to Disneyland. Uh, will you keep an eye out for it? <laughs> <laughs> so I get, so I, I get a lot of stuff like that. <laughs> You're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, well, just like maybe just keep an eye on the project. And if I post one, then let me know if it's you because that's kind of the goal. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> and have you developed relationships with people who who send you or continue to send you stuff? Yeah, you know, I do. When I Whenever I get a role donated and I know that the person has a personal connection to the images, for example, someone has donated a, role, a couple rolls of film after the mother passed away and it was they were probably shot in the 50s and this gentleman i think he was in his 60s or so 
And he said that um, once I sent him all the images, there actually ended up being photographs of him as a child. And so I sat with him as he kind of described uh, over the phone what the images were of. And he was like, oh, that was my buddy from down the street. And oh, that was my sister. And that was in front mm. of my house. And right. obviously he'd never seen these photos that were of himself that his mom shot That's great. forever ago. That's great. And uh, what about, uh, well, do you ever turn things away or do people send you, let's say, a set of, of prints already and you say, listen, that's not what I'm doing here. It's just about about un- undeveloped rolls of film or uh, is it are people following the rules? I don't, I don't know how to ask this question, but. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Almost every day someone emails me and says, you know, I've got all these negatives or I've got all these photos from my, you know, uncle or my grandfather who was in World War II and. They're like, they know they're important and they, but they have absolutely no idea what to do with them and they try and give them to me. And unfortunately that just is not what the rescued film project is about. And if I, if I took every print that someone wanted me to, I would have boxes and boxes and boxes. So yeah, unfortunately I have to turn those people away, but I I encourage them to kind of curate their own collection and to scan them in and archive them and share them. But, um, yeah, I mean just yesterday, actually someone mailed me, I got in our PO box, rescued film PO box, I got like 20 Polaroids that someone found like in a, in the street after a flood. Um, and so I reach out, there's a donation form and hopefully they'll fill one out so I can reach back out to them and, um, see what they want me to do with them. I can send them back. Um, but yeah, I just, I just don't have the time or the, the resources to, to archive that kind of stuff. Right. And what's the, um, the oddest format that you've gotten or, or, and the follow up on that, do you process all different formats at this point or what do you work with? So I've got, I've probably received every type and size and emulsion type of film that you can imagine. Um, probably the most unique stuff that I get is the sub miniature film from the sub, like the spy cameras. It's a little like eight millimeter film, but it's for still cameras. Um, and so I, I get quite a bit of those. Well, not quite a bit. I've been getting more of those lately, but that's probably the most obscure thing I get. And, I. In regards to my film processing, um, I can process most types of film, but I am still just using a pretty basic at-home setup. Mm -hmm. So for the things like the Kodachromes and the E4s and things like that, that have to be cross-processed as black and white and have like the Remjet removed and that kind of a thing. I work with partner labs um, in Portland and one in Canada to help me process that stuff. Right. And what's the what's the scene like in Boise? Are there labs still up and running that you can you can deal with, or do you have to send everything away? There is one little lab just up the street from me, actually, that that can process things like Advantix APS film. Um, but there's still a pretty basic lab. I can do everything they can do. So I rely on them once in a while to just kind of help me get through my backlog. Mm-hmm. But as far as I know, there aren't a lot of labs here in Boise. I think most places actually still ship them off to other other labs outside the state. The the video that you put together when you were trying when you initially started to raise capital for this project. You're talking about 1,200 rolls of film, and they were in meticulously wrapped packages, and they were wrapped in tin foil or, or aluminum foil and tape with labeling all over. Whatever, how far did you get with that? What's the story with that batch of film? That's amazing. Yeah, so this, these 66 bundles of film that, that you mentioned, and, I acquired about you two years. Them? Where'd you get them from? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually bought them through a an auction um, and it was sold by the family of the photographer, if you can believe it, um, to me directly. Um, and so I, I just purchased the film outright and it was honestly about two years ago and I sat on it and I kept it cold storage for about a year because honestly, I didn't know what to do with it because I knew if I started, I wouldn't be able to stop processing it. Yeah, nobody's going to see you for seven months. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was like seven <laughs> years <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we we um, estimate it's about twelve hundred rules. We don't know yet because I haven't opened all the bundles. I still have about twenty two to go, and I, I'm still working on it. I, I, the funds I raised, and I, honestly, I try to avoid crowdfunding, um, but for this one, I just had no other choice. Uh, I raised, and I partnered with a lab in um, Portland called Blue Moon Camera, and they are actually processing the film for me because uh, they can do it full time <laughs> and they have a full staff. And um, I'm paying them. They gave me a great discounted rate, and we're still working through it. They've only processed about. 150 of the rolls so far because we just started this process, uh, but we're working through it. I've, I'm, lo- I'm looking at a stack of negatives right now that they sent me from the process film that I need to need to start scanning in. So, and, and this is all from taken by one photographer in one locale. Is that correct? 
Yep, one photographer. Uh, they are all primarily photographs of his children in the 1950s, and most of the images are around their house in East Chicago, Indiana. So wow. whether that's within their living room or in their front yard while the kids are you know swimming in the swimming pool or on their front their front sidewalk as the kids are playing on their bikes and on their tricycles. Mm. And they're, they're not, once again, they're not some amazing historically significant images, but they are really incredible snapshots of that I, era and I that love time. This idea. I love the idea. I mean, yeah, like you said, it's mundane stuff, but because it's a collection, it's a moment in time. It, I mean, to me, it sounds like a great possibility for a show. And, uh, and I guess to follow up on that, do you have any, any interest or ideas in putting together gallery shows or, or anything along those lines? Yeah, we've done a couple gallery um, installments, some here in Boise, um, one in Kansas, and I was contacted by someone else in like Finland, but um, I don't honestly have time. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, right now, my, my main focus is literally just finding film and processing it and rescuing the images. What the project is outside of that, I don't really focus on too much in regards to like the website and, and books and things like that. Like I know that pretty soon all this film is going to be gone, so I'm just focusing on getting the film. Once I kind of feel like I've gotten to a point where I've processed and there's not as much film out there, I'm going to focus more on the actual gallery and the, I don't know, the presentation of the project to any capacity. Right. Well, will but that yeah, day ever I mean, come? I mean, film is, yeah. <laughs> film is going to keep coming in, right? <laughs> Isn't that the idea? Well, I imagine, but yeah. I mean, a lot of these roles are 50, 60 years old yeah. and I imagine people, if they don't know about the project, they're just tossing them or the film right. is just degrading fast mm. enough that I'm not going to rescue images on and, them. And how do you prioritize what, what you process first? Is it the state of degradation or maybe something's very interesting to you based on location or date or format or how's that work? It's really just based on emulsion type. Yeah. The format of the film. And so for example, a couple of weeks ago I processed E6 slide film because I got, mm. I had quite a bit of that sitting around. So next time I'm not going to process E6, I'm just going to move on to maybe black and white and then maybe C41. I just try and, um, it's cause I've got hundreds if not thousands of rolls of each type of black and white. I've got hundreds of rolls of C41. I've got hundreds of rolls and I can't process all them in one batch. So I just kind of alternate and go back and forth just to kind of hit each, each emulsion type. And what would be, I mean, for you at this stage, then what would be, what's most important getting more film sent to you or getting, let's say the, the supplies you need to do this work and donations. Uh, I mean, if we, if we had to reach out to our, our audience, which I guess we are to some degree right now, what, What's important for you at this moment? Well, getting the film is the most important. Um, you do, you do I understand that you're going to be inundated <laughs> with hundreds of rolls of film after this podcast goes out. <laughs> well, at least okay. for me, anyway. <laughs> hey, I'll I'll take them. I, I no matter what, I'll take them. I can't guarantee I'll have a really quick turnaround to get them all processed, <laughs> but I will I will take them and keep them safe in cold storage until I can get to them. So that is, I mean, the, the film itself is the most important, but it is extremely helpful when people either donate money or s processing supplies to the project. Everything besides the Paul film that we already talked about is personally funded by myself. Uh, and so the cost of chemicals and the cost of, you know, film reels and tanks, um, it comes directly out of my pocket. So it's r extremely helpful when people donate. Well, I know. Where, as yeah, well. where do people go to donate if they want to help you out? Where do they go? Well, I actually did set up a whole wish list on B and H itself, um, and so there's a link to that on our website, at rescuedfilm.com. There's a tab that says contribute, and on there, there's a link to that wish list. There's also a direct link to donate to the project. And we'll put that link on when we put a blog post for this podcast as well. Yep. Which That'd I didn't even realize you had that wish list until I think just yesterday. So, uh, so that's hopefully we can help in that way a little bit. Um, yeah. So it sounds like you really feel. Uh, a, a time element, like you really feel that there's a window where you need to get material where it's not going to exist anymore, or uh, I'm sensing kind of an urgency in your voice when you, you say, get me this film as, as quickly as possible. Is that the way you feel? Yeah. Well, I know that, you know, f people don't really shoot on film anymore. And if they do, it, it's more for stylistic or artistic purposes. Mm -hmm. And so these rolls of film that were shot just for you know, whatever purposes for documenting everyday life, those aren't really around anymore. And I know that the cutoff date really probably was, you know, maybe the mid nineties, late nineties, uh, that people just shot these. And so it's, I know that it's basically going to dry up. Like the film isn't going to be around anymore. People either think they can't get it processed and they're going to toss it or they're going to hold on to it forever because uh, they know it's important, but they don't know what to do with it. And so I know that the film is going to go away um, in this capacity. So I'm trying to gather all as much of it as I can 
and kind of hold on to it. Even if I can't process it for three years, I'm going to get it now so that I have it and I know it's safe and I know that it's going to be, be processed. Is there any chance that, say, 30 years from now, you're going to find yourself reaching out again for help with the rescued uh, hard drive project in <laughs> Boise, Idaho? <laughs> <I> rescued <laughs> flash drive. Yeah. yeah. Your flash drive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, that is probably not a project I'm going to take on. <laughs> not I as think, romantic. Uh, the There's something nature. very unromantic about that. I don't know. Just a garage full of hard drives. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, and the, the really unique thing about rescued film is these images have never been seen by anyone but myself, primarily. That's I interesting. Mean, That's until I put correct. them out on the web. So when I process this film, I'm the very first person who has ever seen that photo, and that includes the photographer. The photographer has only ever seen the shot framed up in a viewfinder or rangefinder. I'm the only person who's ever actually seen the final image. And to me, that is one of the most intriguing parts. And one of the thing that, things that drives me to process all this film is to know that I am the first person to ever see that image. But it also gives me the sense of responsibility and humbleness about the fact that I am the first person who gets to see this image. And when you think about a digital, you know, an SD card or something like that, these images have already been seen. They've possibly already been printed and hung on walls. Uh, not that people really do that much anymore, mm-hmm. but right, um, right. so it doesn't have yeah it doesn't have that appeal as much and that, that intrigue to it. Do you do you have a gallery of images that you that appeal to you that people can go to to view? Yes, um, we I try and put as many as I can on our website at rescuedfilm.com, But just to be upfront and honest, our website isn't very good. <laughs> it's not very easy to navigate. It's just a template site. Uh, I'm actually in the process of redesigning it right now, so people can view and keyword search and do things like that. So but I try and, and put as many up on there as possible. Time, of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Every, everything is in our spare time. Yeah, I mean, someone actually is, has volunteered to help me read this on the website because that's outside my skill set. But nice. Yeah, everything. So I get up. You know, I've got to be at work at least by nine. So I'll get up at five or six, work on rescued film till about seven, oh, wow. seven thirty or eight. Yeah, good for you, man. That's go to great. work, and then I'll come home. And I'll work on rescued film pretty much every night to some capacity, whether that's editing photos or scanning photos or opening and cataloging film. And then on weekends, no, not every weekend, but at least once, you know, a quarter or once a month, I'll, I'll spend, you know, a 14 hour day processing. And do you have anybody working? I mean, you mentioned somebody for the website, but do you have uh, friends, helpers, anybody that comes on board with you or is it all you? Primarily, everything is done by myself. I do have a couple volunteers who help with like our social media, our Instagram account, mm-hmm. things like that. Um, I've had some volunteers come to help unpack that Paul film, as we talked about. But mm-hmm. pretty much, it's it's all myself. Have you made any big prints? Anything that you put on the wall behind you for inspiration? Yeah, we like I said, we have had a couple galleries, um, and from that, I've gotten some big prints, some big you know three by five foot um, prints that I just kind of scatter around my house um, and just kind of put up as, as inspiration. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love seeing them in that, that capacity, knowing that it was some tiny obscure roll of film and it has now become this, this right. kind of art print. Yeah. Have any of those large prints sold at the gallery exhibits you've done? We haven't sold any prints at the galleries themselves. I do have an Etsy shop where I curate and I pick some of my favorite images ah. and I do kind of high quality art prints, usually no bigger than eight by 10 cause I have to ship them. Um, right. But if someone wants a custom, image we'll we'll print them for them um, not they're not darkroom prints they are inkjet prints but they are very high quality done at a boutique mm-hmm. printer here in Boise so if somebody wants to skip town and, and like create a whole new identity in a place where nobody knows them you're actually a good source <laughs> for like you know pictures to put around the house you yeah <laughs> yeah if they want to create their own identity you know, <laughs> create, create, whole history. To create a new identity yeah that's my that, that's my mother's side of the family and that's my father <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about pricing yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh in your own work on the side in your video uh, do you say you're a producer do you you shoot digital video i guess right or what yeah you yeah everything i do is actually fitness related i do fitness content for workouts and nutrition okay. and things like that and how about when you shoot still photos Film or For still photography, I shoot primarily on vintage film cameras, um, and I primarily only do like fashion and creative portraiture, which isn't very common in Boise, so I don't shoot that much. Um, oftentimes, I'll just shoot for myself, and I'll go out and I'll, I'll curate a shoot and, and do it just for kind of creative inspiration. Mm. You know, I'm, this may be so far down the line that uh, it's hard to think about at this point, but, you know, when you amass something like this over time, you know, it... it it can create value and, and, you know, even as an archive or even as a collection in itself. And, uh, you know, I hope that 
you, you know, you're able to kind of keep going and, and uh, you never know where something like this can turn into. And obviously some, some great projects start as, as passion projects like this. And uh, it's, to me, it's very interesting. I've worked in, in similar arenas and, and have some historical societies where they've had undeveloped film and, and I went through it and, and uh, on smaller scales, but, uh, but I, I really appreciate what you're doing. So I hope, uh, I hope in 25 years we can, uh, you know, talk to you again and see how this thing has developed. Yeah, no, I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, I, I don't really have any grandiose plans for the project, but I do know that I want to make it available to the public in a capacity where they can search and add re add their own research and really interact with it and hopefully reconnect the images with the people they belong to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of an ultimate goal. It sounds like for you, it's pretty personal. Yeah. but I love the idea that you how you mentioned. You know, you're the first one to see it, and and in some ways that's kind of at the heart of what photographers want to do and be. It's all about kind of, I don't want to say owning an image, but uh, but making that image yours. And, and here you are, it's someone else shot it, but it's yours now. So that's, uh, we can talk about the psychology of photographers oh, later. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Well, that's the truly really incredible part too is so many of these rolls of film go through hell before they get to me. They're just degraded. They've been dropped in water. You know, I've had so many degraded rolls of film. And when you process them, that comes through in the final image. Yeah. You get these mold streaks and you get these thin or really dense negatives. And it kind of creates a new image that is kind of a life of its own. It, it turns more into art at that point as opposed to just the original image that the photographer intended it to be. So what these rolls of film go through transforms them into something else. And that's that's another incredible thing I love about it. Just a fast little uh, anecdote, which maybe we'll include in this or not. We can cut it out if need be. But some years ago, um, a family was selling their farm out in the Midwest somewhere. And it had been in the family for four or five generations. And up in the attic, they found a Kodak brownie that had belonged to their grandmother. And there was film in it. And they sent, they had the, the, they, their mind to send it off to Kodak. And Kodak took a look at it and said they think they could ha help it, help them out. They were able to extract the film, did a couple of small tests, and they developed the one roll of film that apparently was the one and only film that ever went through it. It was an, an exotic thing when this came out, and what she did was when she got the camera for her birthday when she was, I don't know, 9 or 10, she got everybody out on the front steps of the farmhouse, took a picture of the entire family, and the only other time the camera was ever used was when somebody graduated or there was a wedding or a birth, and all of them were just the whole family in the, on the front steps of the farmhouse, and the camera just went away. So Kodak was able to salvage the film, develop it, and they got the names of all of the surviving members of this family and gave them each a leather-bound album of their family history going back to their great great grandparents, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Wow, yeah. And they That's did amazing. it free. <laughs> that actually reminds me of a, another anecdote, which I doubt will include in the, the thing, but I'll mention <laughs> it because I'm so interested. Is several years ago, I, I created a, a, a short documentary festival, and one of the films that we, we included was called A Beach Near Belfast. And it, it follows a similar story where somebody found it was an eight millimeter cinema. Uh, role that they found in Paris, and the f the filmmaker took out the the role, went to Kodak, got the information that he could find it, and tracked down the people. and And it was a family that shot it on a basically a generic beach in in Ireland. And he went and found the family. And wow. the, the film is all about oh. his journey to find this family. And as it turned out, the family had been divided over because of you know the troubles in Ireland. And and this film was shot prior to the family splitting. And it was a it's a great movie if you ever get a chance wow, to see that's it. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Beach wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's kind of the evolution of rescued film as well. I mean, uh, is motion. I've, I've I've been collecting as I find them rolls of eight millimeter and sixteen millimeter film. And I've got several cartridges, a couple dozen so far that have just been piling up. So when I get a little bit more time and money, that's how we're, I'm going to kind of evolve into to motion film. And these are unprocessed also? All unprocessed, okay. yeah, all unprocessed. And so at this point, you, that's all you want is unprocessed stuff. You unprocessed wanna, film, yep. I don't, I, unfortunately, one. I don't accept anything else. I don't, yeah. I don't take negatives or photos or 
People right. have sent me VHS tapes. So I don't know what to do with those. I got some laser discs, maybe. If you yeah, yeah. For our listeners who'd like to help, Levi Betwise, the founder of the Rescued Film Project, uh, move along. There is a wish list at bnhphoto.com where you can go and uh, buy and donate supplies, and we're going to uh, supply a link to it uh, on our website. Or you can go directly to rescuedfilm.com and take a look around for yourself. It's a terrific project, and uh, the energy is, is wonderful. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Dick, welcome to the show. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. How did you get involved in respooling film? Which, and again, I'll back up again. Uh, that there are a lot of camera formats, film formats that used to be around. If you go back fifty, sixty, eighty, hundred years ago, that aren't available anymore. And and with digital coming about, there are fewer and fewer films available in fewer formats. Uh, and if you have an older camera, you couldn't get film for the lo- uh, for the longest time, and then you decided to start re-spooling this. So, how did you get into that? What what, what triggered all of this? I um, was at a photographic historical society meeting, and then President uh, Robert Navius suggested that we all do something special to observe the hundredth um, uh, anniversary of Kodak and the hundred and fiftieth anniversary of the announcement of the invention of photography. Uh-huh. So I, I thought about that, and uh, I thought, geez, you know, maybe I could spool up some films in those older formats and and make them available to, to the guys who'd like to shoot the older cameras. So I started out on a small scale. I, uh, I had all of my friends at Kodak tell me I was crazy, that it was a technical impossibility for me to do that without having available to me all the technology that was available to a a manufacturer. Well, I never did listen too well, so (laughs) I tried it. I tried it. I, I, I bought what paper I could get on the open market. It was actually called box wrap. It was uh, shiny black on one side and dull black on the other. And that was perfect. It sounds like being being in the Rochester area uh, enabled a lot of of what you're doing. Is oh, that true? I mean, absolutely. I mean, you were on, you, said, you said you bought the original paper on the on the open market. Uh, how did that work? It was, it was just it was a box wrap, and it wasn't opaque enough to hold back the light for a medium speed film. It worked all right for the low speed film, but it, it uh, when you put it on a light box, you could see the little pinholes of light coming through. Yeah. So uh, I had to get something better, and and they made it, and and it was wonderful. I uh, I then had them transport it to my uh, screen printer. He sheeted the roll to the proper length, uh, and then um, screen printed it with eighteen different film formats across the width of the roll. How Uh, how did you get your name out there? How did people find out about you? Well. It turns out that uh, uh, popular photography uh, heard about me and uh, interviewed me for an article. And about what year was this? uh, 89. Okay. I also got a lot of calls from the Kodak Information Service (laughs) because they had agreed to tell people that I existed and how (laughs) to contact me. (laughs) So they'd call in and they'd say, you guys still making the 116 film? <laughs> no, Codex. We stopped making that a long time ago. Well, where can I get some? Well, there's this guy in Honey High Falls, and if you uh, give him a call, he can probably help you. Hmm. So they were so pretty supportive. That's the way it went. Good. So a lot of the referrals came from there at first. And at, and and, at uh, this stage, was it? Uh, did you realize it could be a sustainable business, or were you still putting more yeah, money yeah, in? Yeah, sustainable yeah. Sustainable in quotes. Right. <laughs> uh, it, it, it paid for itself and left a little in the kitty, you know. Gotcha. It never was a barn burner of a business. Right. And right. 
basically, I wasn't set up to do a barn burner business. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would have had to have additional space, additional equipment, additional help. And I was happy with the, the volume I was doing, and I just left it right that way. So anyway, sooner or later, the various photo shops around the country picked up on me and had a little thing in their file. When a customer asked for one of those films, they'd pull it and say, here, contact this guy over in New York. He can probably help you. So that's the way I got started. And then uh, uh, b and picked up on it and offered to uh, sell that film to their customers. And I know I discovered you when I was I was doing a retro camera test on a a 1936 Kodak uh, bullet camera. It's 80 years old, and I knew the film was 127. It was discontinued, but I saw that we still carried it on our website. And that's when I went down to uh, our buyer and I said, "Where are we getting this stuff from?" And he goes, "Oh, guy up in Rochester, Dick Haviland." So, and that's how we, you know uh, we we established a relationship. But I always I just thought it was pretty wonderful that somebody really cared that much to make it possible to use you know you know Uncle Jake's camera you know that hasn't been used in fifty it, years. It has been a labor <laughs> of love over the years. Must be. There's so, times when I wondered about my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that people were. Wondered about it as well. well. <laughs> it, I mean, when, when you were starting this, it was still the film era, and I don't think that the people at Kodak or anywhere else really could foresee the future uh, in terms of the the digital technology that would take over. Can you kind of describe how it how it turned and how things changed when, you know, not too long later, the the film industry is is falling apart. People are turning to digital. Was there a kind of a real quiet time, and now you're seeing it pick up again, or is that uh, in terms of the volume of my business? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't see that turn. Oh, that's interesting. No, no, that just can't. See, mm -hmm. My customers aren't uh, techies. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're not into the latest gizmos. Uh, we had a few contacts with people like the museum in Chicago. This was the Chicago Field Museum. That you're referring yeah. to. They asked me if I could produce some film for a 123 folding camera, which was the first one they used way back when to photograph their work at Machu Picchu. Huh. And they were going to go back again that year, and uh, they wanted to take that camera and some film that would work in that and repeat some of the photos. When we met up at your uh, home a few months ago, uh, you were telling me a story about William Christenberry, a photographer who used your services, and we just found out he just passed away a few days ago at age 80, uh, and he was oh, working on a goodness. project. Yeah, yeah, I had to break the news to you this way, but uh, you actually mm -hmm. worked on a project with him. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, well, what he was doing was going back to his home state of Alabama over a period of 30 years, he would visit and photograph areas where he grew up, especially older buildings, and show how they changed in function and how they changed in condition until they were, you know, just completely swallowed up by the growth around the, the buildings. So he has this sort of 30-year look at these neighborhoods in Alabama. And that was just, you know, one facet of his career, but it was the one where he used my 620 film, my 620 film, the <laughs> 620 film that I sell, and uh, and he would uh, he would photograph those, and then later on he he didn't make three dimensional uh, representations of some of the buildings, and those became part of his show as well, and he did. <clears throat> two-dimensional artwork as well. So he was an all-around artist. Interesting. Uh, photography, painting, uh, sculpture, whatever. Was it the same and camera so, that he had been using for years? Is that one of the reasons why he wanted to use that same film, or is it different cameras? I don't know if it was the same camera, but it was, uh, they were all 620. So it I was a consistent that. look that he wanted about the pictures, and that's why I stuck yeah. to the film. Okay. Yeah. I took him up. Uh, when I visited him once, I, I took him a folding version of that uh, 620. He had been using the, the box, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a folding version of that. So I took that and gave it to him, and I told him to make him a little 
easier to pack. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate that. He says that he was getting older and he, he really didn't want to carry more than he had to. So, so how, for how long of a period of time was he a, a customer of yours? Oh, for about five or six years. I see. And he invited us to uh, an exhibition that he was curating for the uh, Smithsonian. So we were fortunate to go down there and have him as our personal guide. Oh, that's great. Through that's the neat. show. <laughs> just wonderful. Wonderful man. His wife, too. She was just a very warm and <laughs> gracious person. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. We yeah, really sorry we had that. to break that yeah. news to you over, uh, over the interview. And do you know of any uh, of his work that was specifically shot with your film? I mean, any any image, or did he... I can't be sure which ones were shot with yeah, my film, hard, no. Hard to know, yeah. yeah. And I know that sometimes he also worked with an 8x10 view camera. Mm-hmm. And the camera that but you brought to him, what, what model was it? Do you know the brand or the model? Do you remember? Oh, well, it was a Kodak. Uh-huh. A 620 Kodak Jr. And w- right. what is the uh, most popular or most requested format... Uh, 620. 620. You, okay. you guys will remember uh, Brownie Hawkeyes mm-hmm. and the Kodak Duraflex cameras. They were made by the millions, mm-hmm. and they're all 620. Right. right. Yeah, <laughs> so brownies. 620 to this day is my biggest seller. Huh. And are most of, your, cameras. most of your customers are individual photographers or institutions? Well, I guess now you sell through, through retailers, but... Uh, yeah. Is it fair to say that most of them are individual hobbyists or? Uh... Yes, for the most part, that's true. Okay. I still do an occasional uh, university art program or they wanted to make the film available for their students or, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of thing. But that really was the exception. The rule was that I was taking two or three roll orders over the phone, and that got to be a real drag because. It's kind of like running a dairy farm. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to stay and milk the cows. Yeah. I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I was looking for a way to get somebody else in the distribution seat. And uh, that's where DNH has helped you tremendously. Actually, I got a order ready for you folks that's going out to today. And uh, About how big is that order, for example? How many rolls of film are we talking? Well, it's uh, about. 250, yeah. Well, that's a good order. That's a good order. That's a good order, yes. So let me, what about a, a lot of the materials? Because, again, you, you're buying raw stock of film now from Ilford mostly. Is that correct? I do buy the 127 stock from Ilford. Okay. And I'm going to hope to reintroduce the 116. So I've got some of that stock coming from Ilford. It's actually in the country now, and I should be getting it in the next day or two. What about the but paper backings and, and all the other stuff? Is it getting harder and harder to get the materials that you need to indeed. put out this product? It is indeed. How, and also, how, how much of the process has to be in total darkness? Because you're handling film. Okay. That's, that's, that's the greatest challenge, is the darkness issue. Um, for the uh, 620, I'm just re 120 onto 620 spools. Mm-hmm. So that can be done in a dark box or a dark bag. And uh, so that's it's not rocket science. Stuff that has to be done in a dark room, that's more of a challenge. Because that has to be total darkness now, because I am using uh, medium speed film. So what films are actually available now that you can work with? Because a lot of them are just gone. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the 620... It's uh, Tri-X, T-Max 400, and uh, the uh, Kodak Portra color film. Mm-hmm. Portra 160 or, or, one, or 400, but I find that my customers want the 160, so that's what I offer. Uh, anyway, that's, that's really basically what's available. Uh, and then if I step outside of the uh, framework of one... Uh, pardon me, 620 and 127 and 828, then I'm into having to slit from uh, an old, uh, it's called Panatomic X. ASA 32. Uh, yeah, yeah. Very fine grain. Mm-hmm. And uh, so 
So anyway, panatomic X is what I had. I got it from a photographer in Chicago who was up in years. I kind of lose track of those guys. But, <laughs> but he, he sold me several rolls of this panatomic X. Now, when you say and rolls, so how, was, how long are these rolls? This, is, this isn't just a 500 little... 500 feet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 500 feet by uh, 5 inches. Huh. Yeah. No perfs, just... Just the film. That's great. Thanks so much to Levy, who you can find at rescuedfilm.com and Dick Haviland at filmforclassics.com. And remember to reach out to us about your favorite new cameras from 2016. And for John, Jason, and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today.